You're listening to Learn to Catch Catfish, Catfishing Radio, with your host, professional guide, Chad Ferguson. Catfishing Radio covers tips, tricks, and information to help you learn how to catch more and bigger catfish on your next fishing trip. The ultimate resource available for expert catfishing information. After listening, make sure you visit LearnToCatchCatfish.com. Now, here's your host, Chad Ferguson. Hello, everybody. This is Chad Ferguson, LearnToCatchCatfish.com, and this is, again, Catfishing Radio, Episode 1, the very first podcast episode of Catfishing Radio from Learn to Catch Catfish. And I'm going to cover today in the podcast episode a little bit of the background behind Learn to Catch Catfish because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of new people that uh, may come across this podcast through some other sources other than directly through the Learn to Catch Catfish website that may have never been there before. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background as a fishing guide and in the sport of catfishing and then talk a little bit about what my plans are for catfishing radio in the future and then I'm going to go out and answer a couple of the questions that have been submitted through the ask a question page on learn to catch catfish.com and before I get any further into that because I do get a ton of questions through the learn to catch catfish website I want to say that I set up a phone number specifically for the Catfishing Radio podcast. And what that number is, you can call in and leave a question that you'd like to ask for Catfishing Radio on that that, that voicemail. And once you leave that message on the voicemail, we can take it here and include your question in Catfishing Radio so we can go in and have really more of an interactive live show and that phone number is 817-381-5604 so you can always go back to learn to catch catfish and click on ask a catfishing question up at the top of the page and send a question by email but if you have a question specifically that you'd like to call in with uh, feel free to call and again that number is again 817-381-5604 and I left some instructions there on the voice message on what to do and how to go about leaving your question. Just some little tips so we can make sure that we can use it here on the Catfish and Radio podcast. And uh, I'll include that number on the website when we start talking more about the podcast episodes there at learntocatchcatfish.com. The other thing I want to say is if you're specifically looking for the podcast episodes, you can go to Catfishing Radio. That's catfishing, plural, C-A-T-F-I-S-H-I-N-G, radio.com. And that will take you directly to the podcast episodes at Learn to Catch Catfish. And we're working on getting these episodes up on iTunes and everywhere else we can get them out there to try to spread the word, get more people listening and, and joining in and helping people to learn how to catch catfish and promoting the sport of catfishing just overall across the United States. So before I go much further, a little bit about my background from the people that uh, have never been to the Learn to Catch Catfish website or maybe have never bothered to, to look at the About page up there at the top of the page at Learn to Catch Catfish. And uh, again, my name is Chad Ferguson. I live in uh, Saginaw, Texas, which is a little small town just north of Fort Worth, Texas. And I've lived here in Texas my whole life and have been fishing my whole entire life just as long as I can remember. I grew up at Possum Kingdom Lake, just about two hours west of Fort Worth, and uh, fished out there from a young age and have been fishing Eagle Mountain Lake, Lake Louisville, the Brazos River, Cedar Creek Lake, you name it, just about any body of water in Texas that has fish in it, I've spent some time on it chasing the catfish at one point or another. So I got started in the catfishing world. I've been a fisherman all my life, used to fish for bass and striper and crappie, you name it, anything that would swim. And about, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, I really got 
serious about catfishing, and I've always done a lot of catfishing. Uh, some of my earliest memories of fishing as a kid were with my father, uh, with him fishing for catfish out there at Possum Kingdom, and that was something that him and I did together a whole lot. But like I said, about 15 years ago, about or maybe 20 years ago, I kind of realized I didn't really enjoy fishing for bass and uh, crappie and all these other species of fish and I really enjoyed catfishing and and the more I did it the more intrigued I got with the sport and learning more about them and the opportunities to to catch catfish here in Texas you know we have them in just about every body of water there is and and I realized I go out to the lake and chunking and winding these lures all day trying to catch bass and you know I'd catch two or three bass in a day that were a few pounds a piece and it was a good day and I spend these days catfishing and go out and catch these big catfish uh, and catch just amazing numbers of catfish and it all just kind of went downhill from there and I just quit fishing for everything else really I still do a little bit of white bass fishing with my clients and uh, do some gar fishing now and then but I would say that 99 percent or better of my time out on the water is spent uh, fishing for for blue catfish and channel catfish and flathead catfish um so anyway that's a little bit of my background and about 10 years ago i started guiding under the name of north texas catfish guide service uh, you can go out to my website is txcatfishguide.com is uh, all the information on my guide service and kind of what i do there and where i fish and i started operating as a catfish guide and once i got into doing that I uh, kind of fell into the whole fishing industry by accident. It's not really a business that I ever planned on being in. It was just uh, really kind of a whole natural progression. So I was running guide trips. And one day I dug out my family's old catfish bait recipe um, and made up some catfish bait from this old recipe. And I started using it myself on some of my guide trips and some of my personal fishing and started having friends and family and people asking me for it so I started giving it away and the whole thing just kind of got out of control I was getting phone calls for it all the time people want me to give it to them or want me to sell it to them I got to a point where I was making uh, so much bait and was giving bait away that I couldn't afford to give it away anymore so we started selling it through some of the local bait and tackle shops here in the Dallas Fort Worth area and put a little website together and started selling some online and that is what is now sold under the name of Rednecks Catfish Bait Soap and uh, you can find more information on that at catfishbaitsoap.com is the website for that and it, that whole thing just kind of got out of control and then it turned into a natural progression of manufacturing and selling the jug lines that we sold under the name of Rednecks Jug Lines for years. You can find information on that at jugfishing.net. So I was selling the catfish bait and manufacturing jug lines and everything else and used to have a website that I operated called whiskerkitty.com and that was uh, what was initially I set up as a website called the Texas Catfishing Resource back in like 2001 I think I started that and that was back when building a website was really difficult and you had to actually know something about building a website I'm one of these people when I go out to do things I, I generally don't read a manual and generally don't ask other people what to do I just kinda jump in and figure it out and I did that with building a website and managed to keep that website up and online for several years uh, probably close to seven or eight years with a message forum and a ton of visitors and people going in there every single day and it got to a point where it was really because when I set it up I didn't know anything about building websites it got incredibly cumbersome to update and manage so I just quit updating it and um, you can go there to whiskerkitty.com it's w-h-i-s-k-e-r-k-i-t-t-y dot com and there probably I would say hundreds if not thousands of pages there on that site 
that uh, I added years ago. And, uh, you know, everything that I originally added to that website is still there. And uh, I used to go and, like, take a, a Sharpie marker and would make illustrations on a piece of paper with a Sharpie marker and take a picture of them and put them on there. That was back when digital cameras were just very first coming around. So it's kind of a big deal to have a digital camera back then. So uh, several years ago, I quit updating that website or doing any, anything to it, and the message board just kind of got stale. So I found myself that I was getting tons of questions all the time. I always had clients uh, that fish with me that would email me and ask me questions, uh, people that buy my catfish bait that would email me and ask me questions about fishing for catfish and different things to do. And I was participating in all these different message forums and, you know, writing stuff on those and responding to people's questions and doing a, a ton of different things. And I woke up one night in the middle of the night, literally like 3.30 in the morning, and just thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if I took all these questions that I'm getting from people that call me and people that email me and all the things that come up on message forums and all these questions that people have about fishing for catfish and put them all in one place uh, to help other people with their quest to catch fish. And I, I literally got out of bed at like 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning and went and bought the learntocatchcatfish.com domain name and built a website. And I'm one of these people that when I get things in my head, I uh, just kind of become obsessed with them. And it drives me crazy. So I sat literally for, for several days for every hour that I had available in trying to, to figure out how the best way to do this all was and, and what the formatting needed to be like and, you know, talking to, to other people and getting their feedback on, you know, what they would like to see and really trying to make a place where I could really share the information that I had uh, so I could really compile all this information that I had and, and help people with trying to learn how to catch more fish or catch bigger fish or catch any fish or whatever the case may be because I would literally get these emails with people that had fished with me or people that bought my bait uh, or just people that would come across my website that would ask me these questions and say you know hey what do I do in this situation or what do you think about this and a lot of times I would spend I mean, literally an hour writing responses to these emails or talking to people to try to help them and you know I would send it and then I started thinking man I mean what a waste that I have invested all this time and energy into answering this question for this one person um, but nobody else will ever see it and not that helping one person is a bad thing um, but that that could really become a resource for a lot of people and so that's where learn to catch catfish com came about so I, I literally just kind of threw together a website and within a matter of about three weeks, a couple of uh, reporters from magazines and newspapers picked it up. And they called me and interviewed me and, you know, asked me a lot of questions about what I was doing and, how, you know, the information that I was sharing. And um, traffic just kind of blew up and the rest is history. So uh, the website's about a year old now. And I've written... I don't know, a couple hundred articles, I think, well over a hundred, and uh, have kind of gone through a quest of making videos and learning how to do that with lots of feedback from my original videos that I put on there with people telling me that they couldn't see them and uh, that I needed to do this different and do that different to try to increase their production. So I'm sure doing the podcast radio show will be no different and that it's going to be a learning process for me to kind of get my hands around this and make it better so it can be a better experience for anybody so when I started learning to catch catfish I had no intentions of ever doing anything other than just throw a website up never thought anything about doing videos and I've kind of been through this this learning journey of doing videos and and putting them up on the website and have actually really gotten in the last few months 
into shooting a lot of videos on the water with uh, action sequences and kind of educational videos and everything else. And that's something I'll be adding a lot more of to the website here over the next couple of uh, months is uh, I have opportunity to get in and edit those. So when I, I started talking to some of these reporters, when I first started the website, I had several guys that would tell me, hey, you know, you need to look at doing podcasting. That would be a great uh, avenue for you to communicate with people and really help share this information. And I have to be honest, at that point, I didn't even know what a podcast was. I had to go and get on the internet and look it up to kind of figure it out. And I really got interested in it and actually got out and started downloading some different podcast radio shows and listening to him. And I found that a number of different websites I follow on a, uh, a number of different subjects have podcast radio shows. And I'm a busy guy like everybody else. I'm always running around blowing and going and very busy. And I found that the podcasts were a great way for me to keep up with the information and the topics that I was interested in uh, when I'm in the car, when I'm out mowing the yard or doing the umpteen million other things that everybody has to do on a weekly basis to keep up with their life. So it gave me uh, a lot of ideas on how I could go about doing this. I get a ton of questions through the website. Uh, I, I feel bad sometimes because I get so many questions I can't answer them all uh, as quickly as they come in and, and have literally probably a thousand questions that I need to go in and get answered. And to go in and type and add links and do pictures and illustrations and all those kind of things is really cumbersome. So I thought by starting this podcast that it would give me the opportunity to go in and answer some of those questions and do so without having to sit there and slave away in front of the computer typing for hours on end trying to put these articles together. Um, I'm still going to do the articles, obviously, but I'm going to start doing the podcasts as well. And I've had a lot of questions since late last fall when I put the uh, announcement up on the website that we were going to start the podcast on you know how often it was going to be available, how many episodes we were going to do a month, and the best answer that I can give you right now is that I don't know, because I've never done this before, and this is literally my first time sitting down recording this, so, you know, it may be something that I do every week, it may be something that I do a couple times a month, it may be once a month, it's just going to really depend on how time-consuming it is, and what's involved in getting it all together, but I have a lot of ideas on some different things that I want to do with the podcast for the website. Um, one of the things that I've, I've wanted to do since the very beginning of Learn to Catch Catfish was I wanted to bring some other people into the fold because, you know, within a couple of months of starting the website, I had a lot of guides, uh, tackle manufacturers, uh, a number of different people in the industry that contacted me and said, hey, you know, this is really awesome what you're doing. We really like the website, really like the articles. If there's anything we can do to help, let us know. And uh, I'm limited a lot by geography and limited a lot by time uh, because I literally work almost every single day in some shape, form, or fashion uh, between fishing and making bait and everything else I have going on in my life. There, there's rarely any downtime. Throw the complication in of trying to keep up with the website and keep articles on there and keep everything fresh on a regular basis. Um, it's really hard for me to break free to run, you know, a couple of hours away or 10 hours away to go spend some time with somebody else talking about fishing or shooting videos or whatever the case may be because I just, you know, most of the time don't have that kind of time. So one of the things I wanted to do from the beginning was figure out a way to get some of these other guides and, and people in the in the fishing industry involved in the website and be able to put that in a format where I could put that on the website and share that with other people because I, I know a lot about catfishing and a lot of different things but I'll be the first to admit that there's a lot of things that I don't know um, just because of where I live and where I fish. I get a lot of questions about big river fishing 
and um, you know we don't have big river fishing here in in Texas. You know most of the the Texas rivers are, are shallow, uh, small, muddy waters, and absolutely no comparison to big rivers like you have, you know the the James River and um, you know Cumberland River and and some of those huge rivers that. Uh, you know, real popular for catfishing, and I get a lot of questions about that. I've had m- more questions than I can count about ice fishing for catfish, and I-, I know absolutely nothing about ice fishing other than the fact that uh, you go and cut a hole in the ice and fish for the, uh, you know, catfish through the ice like that. But that's about all I could tell you because I've never done any ice fishing in my life. So there are some things that I get questions about and, and quite honestly that I'm interested in I'd like to know more about that I want to reach out to other people and get them to participate and get feedback on how we can do that and share that information as well. So Catfishing Radio is going to be a few things. It's going to be some of these will just be me talking and answering questions like this format is some of them are going to be me calling other people up and bringing them in and recording uh, more of like an interview or or a little chat session back and forth between the two of us to help get some questions answered that people have and uh, then we're just going to kind of go from there so as I get into uh, doing this a little bit more and maybe get a few episodes cranked out get some response from people on what they think about it and how they like it see if it works out well then um, we'll just kind of go from there and see how often I should do this and how long they'll last and everything else. So that's a little bit about how I got to this point. And, uh, again, if you want to learn more, you can go to learntocatchcatfish.com, go up to the top. It says About. Um, You can also go to, uh, again, catfishbaitsoap.com is the website for my catfish bait. Uh, Txcatfishguide.com is the website for Rednecks Catfish Bait Soap. You can go to jugfishing.net, learn more about the jug lines that I manufacture. And if that's too much to remember, then just go to chadferguson.com and I have links, I believe, to all that there on my personal website. So I should probably stop there because I've really gone on a lot longer with my background and history than I originally planned to and probably covered a lot more than most people ever care to know. But again, I wanted to make sure I covered all the information so people understood uh, who LearnToCatchCatfish.com was created by and and what I do and how I share that information and why. Uh, Because there's going to be, again, probably some people finding this podcast from other sources that have never been to the learn to catch catfish.com website before so with that in mind I'm going to stop there with the background and history jump in answer a couple of the catfishing questions that have been submitted and then we'll wrap up the first episode of catfishing radio so I'm going to go into the mailbag here from Questions that have been submitted through the Ask a Catfishing question page at LearnToCatchCatfish.com. I'm going back really old. Some of these questions are, I think, a year old or maybe even longer. And I'm going to just start working my way through some of these because I want to do a better job trying to get all these questions answered and caught up uh, in more of a real-time format or at least in more of a timely format. So, again, going forward, if you have questions for the website or for catfishing radio podcast you can go to learn to catch catfish.com go up to the very top of the page and you will see a link that says ask a question and you can type your question in there and email it to me and we'll put it in the queue for questions to be answered Uh, You don't get any kind of response or anything saying that your question has been submitted, but I can assure you that they all go through and we put them in a a mail folder and hold on to them. Usually when I get the same question several times in a row, those are the questions that I jump onto first uh, when I can. And also, as I said earlier, if you have a question specifically for Catfishing Radio, you want to be on the Catfishing Radio podcast, then you can call 817-381-5604. Again, that's 817-381-5604. Leave us your catfishing questions, 
and we'll put those in on the Catfish and Radio Show when we have an opportunity and go out and answer those questions, whether it be by myself or through some of the other people that I'm going to bring in to the podcast here in the future. So the first question I want to go to here is from Kyle James, and I'm going all the way back to March of 2010 right now. And Kyle shot me over a picture of a big blue catfish he caught at Lake Tawakany. And if, for those that are not familiar, Lake Tawakany is a lake about uh, an hour east of Dallas, Texas, and is known as the catfish capital of Texas and is uh, an amazing lake for catching blue catfish and channel catfish. Uh, got huge numbers of big blue cat and huge numbers of, of just, you know, one to ten pound blue catfish. Uh, Lake Tawakany is typically one of the stops on the Cabela's King Cat Tournament Trail and, and is home to a lot of the different catfish tournaments that, that fish here in Texas or come through Texas. So Kyle sent a question and asked, I caught a trophy blue catfish this past Saturday at Lake Tawakany. I took measurements because I couldn't find an official scale. How can I find out the approximate weight? There are numerous websites I've found, and the calculations vary from 37 pounds to 101 pounds. I know both of these are wrong. The blue, the big blue cat was 51.5 inches long and had a 39-inch girth. Any help would be appreciated. Thanks, Kyle. And I'll uh, put this picture up in the show notes on the uh, podcast page there at learnercatchcatfish.com as well. But uh, Kyle, the couple of things about trying to guess the weight of catfish with uh, length and girth is it's very difficult to estimate weight and I personally have a very difficult time estimating weight uh, through pictures as well I can usually look at one in the boat or on the side of the boat and I can usually guess the weight within a few pounds when I see a fish but I have a hard time with pictures for some reason as most people do just looking at the fish that you sent me I'm gonna guess that that fish is probably between 63 and about 67 pounds I may be off there but I'm guessing it's pretty close and I'd be real surprised if it wasn't somewhere in that 60 pound range and um, you know again they're real difficult to estimate the weight off of length and girth and I'll give you an example that uh, Splash the Texas State record blue catfish and former world record blue catfish that was caught out of Lake, Lake Texoma uh, in 2004 was 58 inches long and weighed 121 and a half pounds and the current Lake Tawakany record was 50 inches long and weighed 73 pounds so that's a fish with a difference of about an inch in length, but weighs, what is that, uh, uh, 50 pounds less than the Lake Tawakany record and current Texas State record blue catfish. So it's really, really hard to tell. Um, the advice I can give you is that if you catch a fish, uh, if you don't have certified scales or don't have access to certified scales and you think that you've caught a record, you can weigh the fish, take good measurements. Uh, the best way to go about doing that is take a piece of monofilament fishing line, go from the mouth to the tail and cut it, go around the fish and get the girth and cut it. That way you have two pieces of line to tell you the length and the girth. And take your scales and you can get them certified after the fact if you think you've caught a record. You know, if you go in you the existing record is 70 pounds and you weigh one that's 75, you can send those scales off and have them certified after the fact and uh if you have a good pair of quality scales, I mean it, it's really unless you just have some really junk scales, just about all of them you can get certified by sending them off to a scale shop. It's been a number of years since I've done it. I don't remember how much it cost, but I want to say that the last time I had some certified that they were cost was between $25 and $50. And that's about the best advice that I'm going to be able to offer you on estimating the weight on that fish. 
Okay, so the next question that I have, I don't have a name on this one, came from somebody named Carp Fishing. And the question he sent in was, is hen scratch you use for chumming for catfish the same thing as scratch grains? That's what they call them around here. Uh, I don't know if hen scratch and scratch grains are the same thing. Uh, they call them hen scratch or chicken scratch here in North Texas, and you know there's a lot of different slang terms for everything. You may go 100 miles from here, and there may be a complete and total different name. Um, hen scratch is chicken food that they used to feed chickens. It has sorghum, corn and wheat, I believe a couple other things in it, just kind of depends on who the manufacturer is. It's just kind of a big mixture of all those different grains that you use for making catfish chum. So if you have some grain that has uh, corn and, and sorghum and some other things mixed in there with it, then chances are it is hen scratch or as you call them scratch grains and uh, we covered all that in a couple different articles on learn to catch catfish uh, what you do is just throw that into a bucket and fill it up you know put it about halfway full with the grain fill it up with water a couple of inches up over the top of the grain put the bucket or the lid loosely on the top of the bucket don't snap it down because if you do that Whenever the grain starts to ferment, it lets off gas, the lid will blow off, and I can tell you from first-hand experience that it will make a horrible mess. You don't want to go down that road. Um, if you don't believe me, I have to get my wife on catfishing radio sometime and let her tell you about the time that I hijacked a bucket of souring grain into uh, the house and uh, it blew up. Wasn't a pretty picture. So you just leave that grain in the bucket let it sit. You can throw in uh, a little bit of beer if you want to. Maybe a half a cup or a quarter of a cup of sugar will kind of speed that process up a little bit. If the weather's really warm, it'll ferment really quick. It'll start to bubble. Go back in every few days. Check and make sure that there's still water. You may have to add additional water. Whenever it stops bubbling and smells horrible, then that's when you know it's ready. You can take some of that out, throw it out there in the water, and start catching some channel catfish. I really prefer using soured wheat and soured milo over hen scratch. I don't like to use corn because corn draws carp in, and it also is, is much bigger, so the fish have a tendency to fill up a lot faster on the grain when you chum with anything that has corn in it. But if that's all you have available, by all means use it. I just don't think it's quite as effective as wheat or milo. I really prefer wheat. Go in and read the article on Learn to Catch Catfish called uh, Catfish Punch Bait 101. I kind of walk you through the whole process of souring grains, fishing with punch bait for channel catfish, and kind of the whole process that I use for doing that. And another article I'd go in and read is the article and video about catfishing with a baseball bat. And again, I'll go in and put links to all this in the show notes at Learn to Catch Catfish. Okay, so the next question that came through was uh, from Hayden McClure. And Hayden sent in a question said, if I want it about 150 yards on my bait caster, and it's a 17, 325 pound yard, and I'm using braided Power Pro. How much pound test can I put on it? Um, Hayden, the braided fishing line Power Pro is fi the 50 pound test, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, is the same diameter as 15 pound test monofilament fishing line. And the wording in, in your uh, question that you sent in is a little bit confusing the way it's written out. So I think what you're at, what you're telling me is that um, your reel will hold 325 yards of 17 pound test, uh, which seems a little bit odd. But long story short, is you're going to be pretty close to what you would be using if you're using 15 pound or 15 pound test monofilament fishing line. 
So the thing that you need to remember, I don't use a whole lot of braided fishing line. There was a point in time where I thought it was the greatest thing since last bread. I used to use a line called uh, Spider Line Catfish Fusion, and I thought that it was just the greatest thing in the world. And I used to use it exclusively for fishing for channel catfish with punch bait. One day, I was reeling in a fish, and my line broke. And I realized after the same thing happening several times that the long-term use of the braided fishing line had cut a groove into the ceramic inserts on the end of, on the last two and three eyes of the fishing rod. And that groove that had worn in there from that braided line running in and out of those eyes was causing the line to cut every time I caught a fish and there was tension on it. Um, I think that certainly that there are applications where braided fishing line is good. The advantage is that you get a lot stronger line at a smaller diameter. It is super tough and you know if but unless you're fishing in really heavy timber or in really deep water where you need to eliminate the stretch. I'm not a big fan of braided lines and that's not to say that there's not applications for them and that there's not other people out there who they don't work well because I know a lot of guys that use them exclusively I'm just not a big fan of them they're expensive um, you know they're difficult to fish with they're very hard on equipment but if you do decide to go ahead and proceed with using it. Um, Power Pro is an excellent brand and I've used it quite a bit over the years. I uh, actually uprooted a, about a 40 foot tree out of the bottom of Cedar Creek Lake with Power Pro Fishing Line one time. Kind of a long story I'll have to tell in a different episode of Catfishing Radio. One of these days I'll get Captain Jack Kennedy on here and we'll talk about that story and have a good laugh about it. But the thing that you need to remember if you're going to use braided fishing line is to make sure that you use a backer. And the reason behind that is when you spool the reel with the braided line, you need something for that line to grip to is about the shortest uh, explanation that I can give you. There's a number of different ways that, go up, that people go about that. I've seen some guys that use electrical tape. But what I like to do is keep about a quarter to a half of that reel spool filled with monofilament and then I take some electrical tape and wrap it around that monofilament a couple of times to keep it secure and then secure the power pro to that and spool that onto the line and doing that is going to keep that braided line from slipping on the spool of your reel just again take a good hard look at whether you really need to use braid or not and if that's really the best line for your application and if it is put the minimum amount that you have to have to fish with on that reel you know you really shouldn't have to fill the whole reel up with one spool of line it's expensive and if you decide you don't like it or you don't need it for a certain application then you spend a lot of money you know on one reel so Take a real hard look at that and make sure that that's really the best line for your application and what you're doing. About the only time I use it again, and, and it's been years since I've used it, I actually just use monofilament in all applications now. But about the only time that I use it is if, if I'm fishing in really heavy timber, um, casting right up into some pretty nasty stuff. And I don't do that a whole lot, except for in the fall and winter, so I just don't have a whole lot of application for it. But again, Power Pro is excellent line. I have used it. I've had tremendous success with it. And if you're going to use braided line, that's definitely the one that I would go with. So the next question I have is going back out to another Texas Lake question. Uh, coming in from Don Yellot, Y-E-L-L-O-T-T, -T, I guess is the name here. And uh, Don sent in a question said, I live on Possum Kingdom Lake. The past several years, we've had a problem with fish kills due to golden algae. How will this affect the catfishing on our lake? And um, 
for those that don't know, golden algae is something that occurs in the water and uh, is a major problem in the lakes in the Brazos River system. Uh, Possum Kingdom, inside the Brazos River, Lake Granbury, Lake Whitney. Texas Parks and Wildlife has been battling the golden algae for a number of years now, and it's something that just keeps to seem reoccurring in these bodies of water. And I actually read, I believe it was yesterday or the day before, that the algae was back in bloom now and that they were scrambling trying to do something to contain it and to monitor the effects. And I am by no means a biologist. Uh, I do talk to, to several of them now and then and may have played one on TV, but uh, I am by no means a biologist, so it's pretty hard for me uh, to go in depth and explain to you what golden algae is and what causes it. Uh, long story short, my understanding is based on talking to the biologists that what happens is the algae blooms in the water, it gets into the fish, sticks to their gills, the fish suffocate and start dying off. And there's a couple of links that I'll share in the show notes uh, about golden algae where you can go in and get some more information about that. You can view some pictures of the fish kills and everything else going on. But back to the specific question that Don had about golden algae affecting the catfishing at Possum Kingdom. Uh, you know, again, Don, I'm not a biologist, but I know that with these algae blooms that they've had in the Brazos River system over the last few years, uh, that it's had some pretty damaging effects on the fishing. But I know some guys are still catfishing out there. Uh, I don't talk to them on a regular basis, but I do know some guys that are still catfishing there, uh, and they're doing pretty well. They're still catching some big fish. They're not catching quite the numbers of fish that they used to, and, and the lake is by no means the lake that it was you know, 15 or 20 years ago before the algae hit. But my understanding is it's doing a lot better, and I think that there there still are some catfish in the lake in, in good numbers. But uh, I'll reach out to uh, a couple of my contacts at Parks and Wildlife here sometime over the next few episodes and see if I can get some more information about some of the effects that it's had. And you can also go to Parks and Wildlife website, I believe, if I remember correctly. I think they have some creel survey information on the studies that they do on each lake that's available online. So you can go in and get that information. And last but not least, I'll just tell you that, you know, if you have any questions about it specifically, I wouldn't hesitate to get on the Parks and Wildlife website and uh, reach out to the biologists that are responsible for that lake and ask them some questions. And my experience has been over the years that uh, the, the biologists and, and all those guys at Parks and Wildlife are extremely helpful and willing to reach out and answer any questions that anybody may have about their local lakes or, or how the fish are affected on there. So don't uh, hesitate to reach out to somebody and see what you can find out there as well. And the next question came in from Sam a Akins, or Akins, I guess is how you pronounce that. And uh, Sam sent in a question, said, uh, Chad, I enjoy your website very much. Uh, I was wondering if you could show us how you set up the rod holders on your boat. Uh, Sam, I posted an article not too long ago, and I think you probably sent this question in long before I ever posted the article, because like I said, working on some pretty old questions here. Uh, but I posted an article about uh, Be Ready Fishing Rod Holders and kind of outlined how I have those configured on my boat. Basically what I look for, I like to have rod holders on both sides of the boat, I like to have some on the front and on the back, and I do that for a couple different reasons. I like to have them running down the sides so I can cover a lot of water if I'm anchored and I can fish off both sides of the boat. I like to have them on the back, and the be ready that I use on the back are actually the, the three rod holders that are on an upright stand so I can move them different directions. I can fish off the side of the boat or on the back of the boat. The reason that I do that is because in high winds, uh, you always want to nose your boat into the wind with the anchor, and I like to be able to turn those rod holders backwards and fish off the back of the boat with the nose of the boat pointed into the wind. 
And the reason behind that is that if you tie your anchor rope to the bow eye, um, the little eye on the front of the nose of the boat where you would hook your, uh, your trailer rope up to when you winch it up on the trailer, and anchor off of that bow eye, it greatly minimizes the sway of the boat when you're anchored up in higher winds. So by pointing the nose of the boat into the wind and tying off to that bow eye, you're really going to reduce the sway back and forth. Um, and then I have the rod holders in the front for the same reason, so I can fish off the front of the boat. But outside of that, uh, when drift fishing, I like to run all the rods down the side of the boat and then have a holder in the front and a holder in the back where I can point those rods straight out. Uh, and what that does is that increases the amount of water that I'm covering when I'm drift fishing. Um, I use eight and a half Berkley or Ugly Stick salmon steelhead rods. So when I've got an eight and a half foot rod running off the front and off the back of the boat pointed straight out and then rods down the side, by adding that rod on the front of the boat and on the back of the boat, um, I've increased the amount of water that I can cover by 16 feet or so uh, outside the length of my boat. I'll go in and take a couple of pictures or try to link back to a couple of pictures of that configuration. And you can also go to the article that I have on the website under uh, the catfishing boats section. If you go to other catfishing info and then click on catfish boats and go down to the article that is titled Express Aluminum Boats. Uh, if you look at the video that I have on that article, I kind of show my rod holder configuration and there's a couple of pictures down there at the bottom as well that show how I have those rod holders set up. I've actually changed that somewhat actually here over the last few weeks. Uh, I've got some new Be Ready rod holders to add and change that configuration up um, from Pro Angler Tackle and those guys over there and have changed that up a little bit. So whenever I get an opportunity, I'll go in and kind of show you what I did and how I changed that. Okay, the next question came in from Tom. And uh, Tom sent a message that said, Hey, Chad, I live in North Carolina, and I'm wanting to try my hand at chumming or baiting some areas in the local lake with soured milo or wheat grain. I regularly catch channel cats with an occasional flathead on dip bait and cut bait. My question is, since I'm mainly wanting to target channel catfish, will chumming work year-round, or should it be a seasonal process? Uh, so, Tom... Chumming will absolutely work year-round. It works better in warmer water uh, because scent carries further in warmer water. Uh, and I liken that or, or compare that, tell people, um, you know, if you go out in, in your garage or in your storage building and you have a trash can full of a bunch of old food and stuff waiting to, to haul off your trash, in the wintertime, you probably don't smell it, but in the middle of the summer, you walk out in your garage and it'll knock you over. It's because that smell carries in the heat. So, um, chumming will absolutely work year round. It's not something that I practice a whole lot in the cooler months because I'm usually chasing blue catfish, but it will absolutely work. It's the same process year round, regardless of what the water temperature is. Uh, the only advice I could offer you is just to, uh, you know, obviously change things up a little bit as to where you might be fishing based on the season and the water temperature. Uh, I know some guys that fish for channel catfish year-round, and that's all they do is fish over baited holes. And, um, you know, they do really well with it all year long. You know, they fish those, those baited holes or chummed holes in the dead of winter and in the dead of summer and do exceptionally well all year round fishing those areas, fishing with punch baits and dip baits. So absolutely give it a try and let us know how it works out for you, man. Send us a few pictures of some of those catfish you're catching there in Carolina. 
So now I have another question that came in from Max Howell. And uh, Max sent a message in and said, I'm new to catfishing and fish at Eagle Mountain Lake and live in Bedford, Texas. Uh, what areas of this lake do you feel have the most opportunity to catch blue catfish? I've been told the channel area near the power plant is a prime spot. Do you agree? Any ideas or suggestions would be greatly appreciated. I look forward to the news and information from your website, Max. Uh, Max, Eagle Mountain Lake is one of the lakes that I guide on. And um, while I am pretty much an open book in regards to answering questions here on the website, uh, one of the things that I have shied away from is answering specific questions about where to fish on the lakes that I fish because that's how I earn my income. Um, I can tell you that um, my my outlook on fishing for blue catfish is, is I don't believe in spots. Uh, blue catfish are fish that move around a lot and uh, they're going to be where the bait is. So you find the bait, you find the fish. Um, certainly there may be times of the year that the channel near the power plant may be a good place to fish. Uh, it's not an area that I fish on a pretty on a very frequent basis, but it's going to depend on again the time of year and what the fish are doing and where the bait fish are. You need to focus more on patterning the bait fish using your graph and natural tattletales to go in and find the bait fish at any given time and that's where the blue catfish are going to be. Um, if you, you go into fishing for blue catfish with the intention that you can go to a certain area and find them there all the time, uh, you're going to set yourself up for failure from the very beginning. So that's the best advice I can offer you on finding the blue catfish there at Eagle Mountain Lake. And again, hope you understand the reason that uh, I can't answer all the specific questions that I get about fishing on the lakes that I offer guide services on. Okay, and the next question came in from Cole McWhorter. And Cole sent a question, said, in your article about Sure Shot, and Benny Roberts, she said that Benny prefers blues over channels. Does Benny use his bait when fishing for blues? I know certain times punch bait works well on blues. Just curious. Uh, Cole, I have spent a lot of time over the years fishing with Benny. And uh, for those that don't know who I'm talking about there, I probably should have clarified that in the beginning. Talking about Benny Roberts' Sure Shot Catfish Punch Bait. Uh, so there's an article on the website where I talk about that bait some. Again, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, but Cole, I spent a lot of time over the years fishing with Benny. And I have never one time seen Benny fish with any bait other than his punch bait. And you're absolutely correct that there are certain times of the year that you can catch pretty good numbers of blue catfish with punch bait. Uh, that has a lot to do with the technique and the pattern that you're using. I do know some guys that fish for blue catfish with punch bait year-round and do pretty well with it. My general opinion is that most of the time um, shad is going to outfish punch bait hands down. Uh, there are times of the year when you can catch good numbers of blue catfish using punch bait, but again, has more to do with the technique and the pattern that they, that they are in, and it's a pretty limited time period using some pretty specific techniques. Uh, the guys that do target blue cats with punch bait, uh, they do pretty well with it, but... Uh, it's just not something that's ever produced consistently for me like Shad has day in and day out. So I've been going on here for about 55 minutes now, much longer than I originally planned to. So I think I'm going to go ahead and get this wrapped up and move on. And I'll start working on to some of the other questions 
on one of the next few episodes of Catfishing Radio. So again, this is Catfishing Radio, Episode 1. You can go to learntocatchcatfish.com to get more information. And if you want to go directly to the podcast, you can go to catfishingradio.com. And that will just forward you to the section of Learn to Catch Catfish where I have the podcast added. Um, If you'd like to uh, check out my guide service website, txcatfishguide.com, and then the Catfish Bait Soap website, again, is catfishbaitsoap.com. And if you have questions for future episodes of Catfishing Radio, go to the learntocatchcatfish.com website, go up to the top of the page where it says ask a question, shoot us an email and let us know what your questions are, or give us a call at 817-381-5604 and leave a message on the answering system there and let us know what your questions are about fishing for catfish and we will cover those either in an article form on the learn to catch catfish.com website or here through the catfishing radio podcast and last but not least again this is a new experience for me and not something that i've ever done before creating a podcast so i would love feedback on what you think about catfishing radio episode number one so go to the website go to the ask a question page or send me an email, either one. You can send me an email at uh, catfishing at learntocatchcatfish.com. And let me know what you think about Catfishing Radio. Uh, if you don't want to shoot me an email also, go down to the bottom of the page and click uh, on the comments and leave us a comment there on the, on the page. But I love feedback. If you like this format, you like the podcast, let me know. Uh, if you think that I did a horrible job with this and that I stutter or say uh too many times, which I think I always do, or whatever else uh, you want to throw in there for feedback from me, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think because, uh, like I said, this is a learning process for me, something that's going to take me a little bit of trial and error to get down. So until next time, again, this is Chad Ferguson, LearnToCatchCatfish.com, and we'll see you 